This week's episode with architect Morris Ajmi explores the fusion of art, technology, and urban inspirations. From the enchanting streets of New Orleans to envisioning artist-centric museums, uncover the interplay between history and creativity with a special focus on his relationship with the renowned Aldo Rossi. Join us for an inspiring exploration that bridges the past, present, and future of architecture. It's time to dive in. Hi, hey, Morris. How are you? How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm thrilled. I'm glad that we made some time to connect with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. I've been very excited to talk to you because you have so many different layers of what you do in your career. But I kind of want to start from something that stand out to me because you had the opportunity to work with the great uh, Andrew Rossi back in the day. So can you tell us a little bit about the first time you met him? How was the interaction? A little bit behind the scenes? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I think Aldo's part of what I do every day. You know, I, I feel like that's a foundation for my work. And so going back to that experience and that first time, I think, um, uh, makes a lot of sense. And I have to say that I was attracted to his work. Um, he did the Teatro Mondo in Venice for the Biennale and, you know, that little project resonated with me for a lot of reasons because it it was a modern structure, but it related to the historic uh, buildings and, and uh, cityscape of Venice. Um, and it did it in a new, fresh way. And so that, that sort of has been part of what I do and how I see. But your original question of like, what was it like and behind the scenes? Um, mm. You know, Aldo was completely different than what I expected him to be like in, in that he was very uh, accessible and just like a quote unquote regular person, you know, um, liked movies, loved sushi um, and just loved life. And so it was really and I always say that, you know, sushi was a perfect um, metaphor for what he did, you know, that idea of like repetition and craftsmanship and just you know, uh, everything lined up in, in a perfect way. And so, um, you know, getting to know somebody uh, as a person um, and seeing behind the scenes uh, and what made up his character really was, um, I think, um, instrumental in, in, in my being able to connect with him and really learn with him and be, you know, get mentored by him. So you were there, if I'm not mistaken, for about a decade, correct? Well, actually, I uh, studied with him at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies uh, here in New York uh, for about a year. And then I was traveling through Europe um, the following summer, and he said, oh, we could use some help uh, with a competition. It was a competition for a housing block in Berlin. And I said, yeah, you know, I could, I could stay for about three weeks, and I ended up staying for three years. So, you know. It, they won the competition, and then we did another competition in Genoa for an opera house, and they won that as well. And that was a really great experience. And then I was, you know, young and naive and said, oh, I have to go back to America and get my, um, my um, career on track. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, that experience in Milan was probably the best experience I could have had. But about two years later, Aldo called me, um, and we opened an office together in New York that we had for about 10 years. Um, and so I ran that that's office. A, yeah. No, I was going to say that's, that's quite incredible to be able to reconnect there for a few years. And you clearly made an impression if you really wanted to work with you in that capacity. What about you do you think that kind of stand out that he saw an opportunity to collaborate with you and open an office in New York? Um, I, you know, I mean, I could say something like I'm extremely talented, but I think that that would be presumptuous. Um, I, you know, I, I knew how to work well with him. You know, I knew what he needed. I was not afraid to um, speak up if I thought something should be different and really didn't, you know, I treated him. And I think this came from just being, you know, uh, uh, a student, but also seeing him as a person you know, I, 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 I certainly respected him, but I wasn't so gaga and like, you know, just yes, yes, yes. I would say, wait a second, you know, this might not be the right solution. And so I think being honest and being direct and knowing how to um, extend ideas that he had um, 
I think made me uh, a good collaborator. So that honesty that you're referring to, to become a good collaborator, it was something that you developed throughout the years after getting to know him better and get more intimate about how to deal with his personality or something that you always had as a kid, something that you know was kind of part of who you are? Probably a little bit of both. You know, I think I, I had that, that was my personality to, 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 to question and to, um, uh, be honest with, uh, in, instead of just saying what people you would think they want to hear saying what you believe. And, um, you know, I, I think, look, when you, when you have a relationship with people, um, whether it's work or a personal relationship, there needs to be a certain sympathy, you know, or, or, um, uh, connection. Um, and then I think that, um, you build on that connection. And so I think we had a connection pretty early on and that, um, we were able to um, work really well together and, and do some great projects together. What was the big difference for you after spending three years in Milan and then going back to New York? What was, at one point, did you realize I should have stayed behind? I should kind of st stay back to Milan? Or what was, I guess I'm curious, after so many, so many years I, overseas and then you know, back, I, it's, yeah. it's, it's a strange thing. You know, I think, you know, it sounds maybe cliche a little bit, but I don't think, you know, I ever left Milan. You know, I think what ended up happening was, you know, you, you have these experiences and then they become part of you. And then you really maintain that connection. I just about uh, a little over a year ago, I was fortunate and lucky enough to do um, uh, an exhibition design at the Museo del Novecento, the Museum of the 20th Century in Milan of Aldo Rossi's design work. So Aldo Rossi design, uh, 1969 to 1997. So all of his um, design pro products like Ferralesi, Omoltani, all the furniture, Longoni, uh, Up Group. Um, and going back to Milan felt like I was coming back home. It felt so comfortable, you know, and I hadn't been for a while because of COVID and all the rest of it. So going back, I just felt so comfortable there. And, you know, I think that I always encourage people to spend time to study abroad or go places because you take that experience with you and it makes you a better person, a better designer, and it just opens your mind up. So I feel like I didn't really ever leave and it just made me better. And the, the, the thing that really was transformational for me, I grew up in New Orleans um, and, you know, architecture is an important part of that city. Um, and I've always felt like I wanted to create architecture that fit in, but that was special and of, of our time. And I think that, you know, Milan was a city that was bond, bombed pretty heavily during the war, as a lot of cities in Europe were. Um, and the way that those new buildings were put back kind of resonated with me um, and sort of contributed to the way I look at architecture and the way that we uh, try to um, give back to the city when we're when we're creating um, new uh, projects. If you were to look back and think about this, I mean, Milan has been one, if not the main capital for design for the last 100 plus years. What do you think is that? What, what about Milan and the community in that city was able to thrive and continue to thrive in the 21st century. Well, you're 100% right. And, you know, I would almost make you cast a little bit wider net and just say that Italy is a country that has always been known for design, right? Uh, for art and design and culture, uh, food, you know, I, I, I think it's endless. But I think that there's a certain sensibility of, and it's, it's, it's two worlds, right? And, and I think that's what's been made Milan so successful. There's this amazing tradition of craftsmanship and the legacy of all of the history and then innovation, you know? And so they can keep taking that tradition and making it relevant. And I think that that's really what makes um, Italian design uh, and also any good design, but certainly Italian design um, important. 
um, and why Milan is important, because they're constantly making things better, but also with a sense of craftsmanship and tradition and history and knowledge uh, that just imbues everything that comes out of there with, you know, a sense of um, quality and um, special uh, specialness. Well, you mentioned now that Milan and New Orleans is two cities that has been incredibly impactful on your journey. I'm sure New York is one of them. Any other cities that you have visited throughout the years that kind of stand out that you always kind of look back to as for inspiration? You know, it, New York, let me say yes. You know, I I live here. I and I feel like again like it's another city that's a part of me you know and i go back to new orleans and you know the minute you get off the plane or drive into the city you get you you get like a a, a, sort of a, a rush of heat and humidity and you just feel like you're you're where you are i think the vibrancy and the energy that i feel in new york is is certainly um uh, a part of me and i think drives me and i have a lot of energy and i like having that um that stimulus from the city um you know there's a I, I i said i love cities but you know recently um i was back in madrid and barcelona which was amazing but i think the the the, the place that for me really was uh most special experience i had in spain was in granada at the alhambra and just that whole experience of a of a of an all encompassing you know sensory sensory overload um was really special and beautiful visually um aesthetically and you know also just from uh uh from the sounds and the sense that you get uh being there um also stockholm i was in stockholm recently another amazing city um just everything's beautiful you know from a design standpoint but just the quality of life and just uh, the people there was, was was spectacular. So and and I was fortunate enough to see a Leverance uh, exhibition, and then go out and see some Osplen projects um, and the Woodland Cemetery, which really uh, was, uh, I think, one of those highlights of uh, you know experience wise, just to to walk there and 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 to be in that space and be touched by the the architecture and and the thinking that went behind that design. No, fascinating. Now, I want to kind of go back to where you mentioned that you were in Milan for three years and then you go back to the U.S. At the point you come back straight to New York or you're going to New Orleans? I, I essentially came back to New York. Yeah. Okay. So this is an interesting thing because and then after three years working well, already with a very established uh, you know, architect and designer, and then with in a matter of another few years, you were opening a uh, practice as a partner with him. Did you feel pressure? Did you feel a sense of a responsibility that this would be uh, an office that would have to deliver the quality of work that people are usually accustomed to uh, what they have seen from uh, Andal? Um, yes, you know, I, I was probably so young that I didn't really realize, um, the challenges that were, uh, ahead because, you know, it, it's, it seems a lot easier to open an office than the actual, um, you know, daily grind of what you have to do. And, and so I, I kind of jumped in with a lot of energy and not really worried about what was going to happen and all the challenges that were ahead. So I was able to, to do it um without thinking too much about it and you know what we, was the, the first project challenge that you faced it right away well um i mean i think you know we were fortunate in that when we opened the office uh there was we, we were opening it because we thought there was going to be a project in miami for the university of miami the school of architecture which didn't they weren't able to get the fundraising together but immediately after that there was an opportunity that presented itself uh, for a hotel project in uh, in Fukuoka in Japan, um, and so things were really booming in Japan at the time. Um, an interior designer, Shiguru Uchida, invited Aldo uh, to Japan, and we went. Uh, actually, his son came along as well, and Aldo 
received the letter, I think it was on Christmas Eve, or right before Christmas, and he said, this is either a gift or uh, somebody's joke, because it can't be, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, he's, he's like, I don't know if this is going to happen. But anyway, we went, and it was probably the smoothest, easiest, and best um, project and just experience um, that I had, and uh, it went really smoothly. The project had a tremendous amount of attention and then led to a number of other projects in Japan, which we did out of the, the New York office. So that it kind of went really smoothly um, and and not by any design. It was just by timing and, and, and good luck, I think. So that was a, most of the project you mentioned in Japan. At what point did you feel uh, that, well, right now we have an incredible successful uh firm in New York and you've been working for so many years, but at what point did you feel like, okay, we're, we're getting something right over here. We're establishing ourselves. I mean, I understand Aldo has a big name, but it still is a new market and you in charge of right. this office. And, How long it took until you felt like, all right, we, we're going to be okay. We're going to make this through. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the, um, I guess, bittersweet part of this story because Aldo uh, passed away in a car accident in 1997. And that was right before we, we did the Scholastic project, um, which we had designed it and it had just been approved, but we hadn't started the construction yet. And I remember I saw him right before he passed away and told him that all the approvals were in place. And so I ended up shepherding that project through the construction and it was really as a result of that project, not the projects, you know, out in Europe or in, in Japan that um, helped to stimulate the work. Um, it was that project that really led to the next few projects and then slowly built up um, a portfolio of work. Um, but, you know, that was a brand new project in Soho. And um, Paul Goldberger wrote in the New York Times that it would teach a generation of architects how to build in historic districts and something that could relate to the uh, context but that was relevant for our time and so you know we looked at um, Soho as being caught between the classical world and the modern world at the time when Soho was developed with cast iron architecture that was a tremendously modern way of building and technology you were ordering components from a catalog and you were assembling them. And so like, it was like a modular construction, but you know, this is in the late 1800s and all of the forms were drawn from classical architecture and then starting to be infused with some industrial um, characteristics um, and enabled much bigger openings and windows. And so when people look at it, they think it's, you know, old or old time like, uh, but it really was incredibly modern. And so we tried to do the same thing, create something that was part of that history, but also that was modern. And so we built the building in components, fabricated off site, and really related to the architecture of the two streets that it fronted, one on Broadway, one on Mercer, one classical, one industrial. And that sort of fueled the way I looked at projects and the next couple of projects that I was doing were in historic districts and used that methodology to create a buildings that were of our time, but kind of fit in. So stand out by fitting in. How do you have those conversations with your team or even developers, people involved in the project? Because I feel more often than none, we're very eager to upgrade things. You know, and the idea of upgrading is really changing, making a modern look and aesthetic. But as you mentioned, you for you, it's very important to maintain the history of the building, at least the integrity of the design that came before you. But that's right. a conversation. It's a, it's a balance, right? I mean, how do you approach that in a way that can seem seamless, that belongs to that neighborhood, that you're not only taking away, you're adding to what that neighborhood can be with this new building? It's a challenge. You know, I think, you know, trying to walk that line between creating something that feels like it fits in, but then, you know, a lot of people want something that's iconic, that, you know, is special. And 
Um, I always say, um, you know, we need some background buildings, but maybe special background buildings. And I refer to a cartoon I saw um, a number of years ago. I think it was in the New Yorker. Um, and it's a view down Fifth Avenue. Central Park is on the right. And on every block is a Guggenheim Museum marching down the street. And one Guggenheim is great, but, you know, every block having a Guggenheim doesn't work. And so what I try to, to do and try to convince, you know, and explain to uh, the staff internally and also explain to our clients is that we try to create these buildings that are special, but not that are screaming all the time at the top of, you know, the, the register saying, like, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's like maybe it's something a little more subtle. It's a special building. Um, and it can have different degrees of of that of that uh, exuberance, you know, like the Samsung building that we did uh, is 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 very dynamic, um, but it still fits into the neighborhood um, in the meatpacking. So, do you feel this idea that you mentioned about buildings that have the screaming "Look at me" is the 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 approach of an architect of design to stand out, and has we gone too far? in terms of all the new development now has to have that element to be over the top to be able to get, I don't know, press, recognition, visibility, that sort of thing. I, I think the simple answer for me is yes. Have we gone too far? But I think that, you know, it it, it works for some people and that is their approach, right? I You know, that I, I try to be a little bit more nuanced and a little bit quieter and not always um saying look at me um but i think that mm -hmm. we if we can reward people with looking more carefully um then we can do things that are um quality and special but don't necessarily you know it's like the song that you love the first time you hear it and then by the 20th time you can't listen to it anymore you know i want something that's going to resonate for the next 10 years you know so maybe when you first hear it it's okay, or maybe you don't even like it, but then the more you see it or the more you hear it, um, the better it gets. Um, so I think it's 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 a challenge because you know there's a lot of pressure on on designers and architects uh, in particular to create that big bold statement, and it's like how do you do that in a way that's going to be relevant? Um, you know, five, ten, twenty, fifty, or a hundred years from now. Do you pay attention to critics? Do you read it when they have a new project coming up, what the New York Times is saying or the Guardian or whatever it is? Yeah. Is this something that you at least aware of it? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, when they like what you do, you, you're happy. When they don't like what you do, you, you don't think they know what they're talking about. But um, I do think... <laughs> I think I think we have to we have to be true to our um, you know our DNA our tenants our, our our thoughts and what we're doing uh, you know I I was recently with a client um, that you know I presented something and and you know years ago and they were like well why would we want to do that and now you know ten years later they're like yeah we want to do that it's like you, you, if you if you stick stick with it long enough, people will appreciate it. And I and I and and and, and I think that um, it's important to hear and listen and see and understand what's going on. But I don't think you should follow every trend just because it's what's happening, um, because then you you don't have a you know a core, or you don't have a value. And I think that if we you know I look at artists all the time, and you know there are artists that quickly come to their mature period and then they just do the same thing over and over again. And then there are artists that, you know, every year have something completely different or they have, you know, periods where they then, you know, grow. And I think that those are both valid points. Um, but you can't do both. You know, I think you need to have a, a, a way of thinking about your work and, and grow, uh, but at the same time, at least be true to um, your your uh, your core values and and your nature, um, 
Otherwise, it, 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 it's not real. But like for a young designing architect, there's so much output and input going on right now. There's so much information. You can find inspirations for almost anything. And now with AI, things are really out of control. How do you find that core? I mean, how do you develop the, the personality to understand who you are so you can express that through your work? It's challenging. It's really challenging because, you know, I think... Uh, when you see something or hear something that's sexy, like AI, like, oh, that's going to be the, the, the answer to all our problems. I, you know, I, I think that, you know, I was talking to a, 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 an architect, a really talented designer the other day, and he's almost, I don't want to say too resistant, but completely resistant to technology, likes to use, you know, a pencil and tracing paper and not learn any new software and um and 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 i said you know well think about the enlightenment you know when graph paper came out that was new and that was something that you know the grid sort of influenced all of the architecture during the enlightenment and you you have to at some point embrace the technology and make it work for you and i think that ai is not going to be the answer in that you're going to say we need a stadium and then it's going to be finished. It's going to be part of the, your tool set. And I think we need to keep incorporating these things into our workflow, um, but understand that they're tools and that the ideas and the concept and, and the talent that's needed to create um, great architecture or great anything um, is going to come from a mind, not from a computer. Yeah, that's a topic that has been very um, often discussed here, you know, because we do talk to creatives from all part of the spectrum, from you know, architects to designers, curators, artists, and so on. And I think everybody kind of approach very similar to you, what you're saying. It's more of a tool than a be-all kind of situation. And it will be interesting to see how this next generation approach it and how far will let us uh, you know, improve the industry as well in terms of technology. Any other technology outside of AI in the last couple of years that you feel is something can be a, a game changer in the industry? Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, visualization um, technology in general, I think, has, has, been, has changed the way we work. Um, initially, I thought, you know, renderings were going to be a great tool to show clients like, oh, this is what the building's going to look like. I think it's exceeded my expectations in terms of that because it's become a tool for us to actually look at a building and understand how things fit together and how they go together and animation and walkthroughs and looking at spaces. So I feel like that has been um, very helpful in the design process. I was recently, uh, maybe, I don't know, say within the last year in Miami uh, and went to see a sales center for a project that we had nothing to do with. But I think that this was, is the future. Uh, went into a space that was probably the size of a, it was a large like warehouse space, concrete floor, nothing in the space except for I don't know, maybe 20 Wi-Fi nodes on the ceiling and a bank of computers and a couple of guys uh, working the, the keyboards. We put on headsets and uh, they said, uh, now this is like bigger than a basketball court, but they said, okay, um, there's a red circle on the ground. I want every, we want everybody to meet there. So you go there and you sort of get a sense that there are people around you. And they said, okay, we're going to take you up to the terrace. And you go, you, you're, you're, you're transported up to the terrace and you see the building, a blue field and lines, white lines, like almost like an old blueprint. The building and the terrace are being constructed in front of you in real time. And then all the surfaces are applied. And so you're literally in a virtual world where you're looking around, people swimming in the pool, DJ mixing tunes on the side, a big screen, 
people dancing, I mean, swimming. And then, you know, we went through a series of different spaces. Now we're going to the lounge, we're going to a restaurant, we're going into an apartment, and you can walk around and look and see the spaces. And in, inhabiting a space virtually is like the next level of seeing what a space looks like on a computer screen or a sheet of paper. And so I think that this is what what's 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 you know going to happen. We're going to be much more um, uh, uh, embedded into the spaces that we are creating. Uh, both like this was a sales center, so they were obviously selling. There was one point where they said, if you walk into the bathroom and you walk into the bathroom, you put your hand under the sink, and it looks like water is coming. You know, I mean, you're really experiencing the space. Um, and I think that as a sales tool, it's phenomenal. And, you know, it's better than going into a sales center where they have a kitchen and a bathroom set up, you know, and pictures of the renderings of the building. You're really experiencing the building. Um, but I think that will become more part of the way we actually create the buildings and the way we create spaces and objects. Um, so you'll, you'll be able to see them, visualize them, and experience them. Uh, in a way that we don't currently uh, do. Yeah, it would be fascinating to see what's going to happen at that point. I wanted to go back a little bit back in time. Uh, okay. Because now we would be very much ready to talk a little bit about, you know, your work and the future of architecture and things and that. But uh, I want to go back to New Orleans, growing up okay. there. And right. being able to be exposed to the city, it's such a beautiful city, so much different cultures involved over there. And you have often said how influential uh, being yeah. there was for you. Yeah. But what about your family? Tell me about your upbringing growing up. Were your family uh, supportive, always, you know, uh, supporting you to pursue uh, architecture or being creative? Tell me a little bit about them. Um. You know, both my mother and my father were very um, interested in me being educated, you know, and studying and learning. Uh, my father had um, a number of um, stores um, uh, in in the downtown area, and I worked there from when I was a young kid, like, you know, during high school, um, and just was always around. And his dream would have been for me to take over his business, which was successful, and, you know, I was like, I hate this. I don't, you know, I don't like, you know, working in a store and waiting on people and selling and doing all that stuff. And, you know, I really liked art and I liked architecture. Um, and I decided and he was, he was supportive, but he wasn't really excited about me being an architect. And I think, you know, eventually he was very, you know, once I was, you know, I went to Milan and, you know, they, they helped me, you know, uh, with, with all my studies and, and, and financially. And, but he, you know, eventually he was very happy that I did it, but, you know, I, I, I learned a lot and I think we all learn a lot. And I always tell my kids and, uh, everybody that you don't know what you learn during a situation and, you know, learning how to deal with people being in the store really helped me to communicate and to relate to people and present work and, and be, um, an architect even though it was a completely different pr profession. And so I think that, you know, that time was, Im was important for me, but it wasn't important in the sense that that's what, that's what made me be an architect. I think the first experience I had, uh, and I was always downtown around the French quarter, you know, fascinated by, um, uh, the architecture, but, you know, I went with a, with a class, um, and we, they said, you know, you, you can draw anything you want. And I, I, I just was fascinated by the grill work and the balconies. And I started drawing the columns and the teacher then said, well, why don't you learn about the orders of architecture? And I was like, what are the orders? And she's like, it's the language of how things, buildings are built. And that really got me interested. And that was kind of like a pivotal point where I really was focusing more on architecture. And then I started noticing all the similarities in different buildings and how that there were families of buildings. And that led me to really study about typology and, and understand that there were things that um, were underlining that, you know, related or made buildings um, part of and relate to each other. 
How old were you then? Well, when I, I was, I was, you know, when the first time I was drawing that, that, that experience when I had drawing, I was probably eight years old or something. It was a, you know, class trip. I was like in third grade, I think third or fourth grade. Um, and then in high school, I started um, really studying. Uh, we had a class called environmental design. And, you know, that was uh, where I really started looking at the buildings and understanding more about, um, you know, porches and different elements that, um, were um, you know, part of the uh, the language of New Orleans um, architecture or domestic so architecture. Was at at that point? Did you have uh, an architect or designer that kind of stand out? Or like the first one that you made an impression on you? You mean a favorite architect at that time? Yeah, or, like no, when you so. started like researching. Yes, when you start like learning a little bit more about the industry and architecture, when you let's say you, you saw know, it, somebody's it, work for the first time, you know what I was I, I was always I was really always fascinated by the historic architecture in the city, like the, and and all of the buildings, like the you know the, the 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 shotguns and the townhouses and some of the you know mansions and and and. Uh, uh, plantation homes that that were there and just the way that those buildings had all the same elements but they were configured in different ways so that was really the start of my interest not a specific person and then you know there were a number like gallier was a famous architect um in 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 uh in new orleans and had done both some uh civic buildings as well as um residential buildings uh which i found out about later but i would say i was just fascinated by the the fabric of the city, you know, and the, the 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 dramatic kind of qualities of that architecture, you know, even on little houses that had like really um, uh, uh, beautiful detailing. I heard a recently a conversation that you mentioned that you like to design and build a museum that yes. uh, you believe to do something that focus on the art and the artist instead of being so much about the the build itself how do you accomplish that well i need to get a commission first but then i'm ready um for the challenge <laughs> um you know i i we have an art program in the office and uh i started that uh when we moved about eight years ago uh into our new space in 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 the financial district and essentially that started with an exhibition of aldo rossi drawings that i had i've always been um interested in art and you know i i think my father allowing me to be an architect was that it was a profession. If I told him I wanted to be an artist, he definitely probably would have, you know, not allowed me to do that, you know, but, um, I, I, I am, uh, I still love art and it's an important part of, um, my process and an important influence into the work that we do and draw on many artists for that. So I feel like there's a debt there to, uh, art. Um, and we started this program with the exhibition of Aldo Rossi drawings and have maintained that, you know, on a regular basis, having new, new art and new um, exhibitions. We did one that was based on scent. Um, so you got a, a century um, experience coming into the office and, you know, we're going to continue to expand that. Um, I think the way to celebrate artists is to, is to create spaces that um, can accommodate different types of art and also be more flexible. Um, in their configuration, but also one that's not, you know, where the building isn't so present. You know, there are a number of, you know, the Guggenheim is a beautiful building, but I think that, you know, the shows, everybody's like, well, did the show work in the building this time, you know, because of the ramp and the slope and all the rest of it. Um, you know, and then there are other uh, museums and without going into any specific ones that really are about the statement of museum. Um, and I think that that's good. That also relates to this whole idea of like creating an icon for a city or, or, or a place um, that's really about that the image and, and that statement. Um, and so I think if we can create something that has um, 
flexibility in terms of the way you move through it or the way pe- thing, work is in, incorporated into it and the type of work that can be incorporated, I think can then be um, more celebratory about the work um, and, and less about the, um, the building. And, you know, as an architect, that it's like, well, why would you want to do that? And I'd say, well, our, our job is to create the best building for the use. And I think the best building for a museum is one that celebrates the work and not celebrates the person who designed the building. Is there any museum that you've been to that you feel like it has accomplished that goal or at least get closer? You know, I think, I don't know. I, you know, cause I, I go to, you know, anytime I'm in any city, I try to go to all the museums and, and see that. And I always feel like the museum is very present, you know, even like the Met, you know, it's mm-hmm. a mess. Um, and, but it's an amazing place to see art from all over the world and all different periods. So I think that the museums are always present. So like the idea of trying to create a museum that's not, that you're not aware of is a challenge. And, you know, maybe it's not even possible, but I would like to try. Well, I was going to say, if someone can get close to that, it probably would be you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Morris, uh, now we're part of the, the the show that I like to ask three questions to everybody that comes here, and okay. then the first question, all right, is uh, we we want you to recommend us a book. It can be something that you read recently or your favorite book, something like that. So uh, we can go check it out. Uh, number two, recommend us a movie, a TV show, something that interesting uh, to you that make an impact or entertaining. Uh, okay. And number third, the third one is, um, I guess, who should we invite to be here at the, the podcast next time? Wow. Okay. The problem is there are too many books. I, lo- I love to read. So I, you know, I can, I, I'm going to, um, can I, can I recommend a series? Yeah, please. Okay. I guess it's cheating a little, but I'm going to do it. Or at least, how about pushing the limit? Um, look, I love reading. I could I could give you books in all different. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a couple. There's a there's a series of books called Thirty Three and a Third. Obviously, the speed of a, an album, um, and there are hundreds of books that are dedicated to, to different albums and you can find everything from, you know, punk rock to rap. So everything is there, classic rock, whatever you want. And each one is a personal story about that book. It's like, you know, I used to sneak into my brother's room and listen to this record when I was 12, or this is the story of how, you know, David Bowie, you know, came up with this album or whatever. And I, I really, Love those books because they're personal statements, but they also resonate in such a big way. I just recently read um, uh, The Velvet Underground and Nico, uh, which was a really great, um, a great one. But there's a whole, a whole story. And I think you can, I, I recommend that because I think anybody can find a, a record uh, that they love or that was important to their, you know, being. Um, and get deep into it, you know, uh, another green world by, uh, Brian Eno is another really good one to read. Uh, but they're, they're all great. They're all great. So, um, I would say that series for a book and hopefully that, that, that satisfies you. Um, and then, um, Tarkovsky is a, one of my favorite directors. Um, and he did a movie uh, called Stalker. It's like a post-apocalyptic yeah. um, story. Uh, visually, incredibly uh, stimulating. I think it's it's perfect for our time. You know, thinking about uh, technology um, and nature and um, some big 
fundamental questions there. Um, but I think that that is a really amazing uh, movie, one of my favorites. I have so many favorite movies, but that one um, is a long movie, but also one that you can kind of fall asleep and wake up, and it's kind of it's still there, you know. So it 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 it's a, it's a it's a it's a dramatic story, um, and it it sort of fades between black and white and color and. You know, it, it's 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 really um, uh, one of my favorites and tremendously stimulating, and I think um, one people will enjoy, or hopefully enjoy. Um, and then guest, um, you know, I I am a big big fan of Brian Eno, his music. Um, I've also, you know, he 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 he's he's responsible for creating. Uh, ambient music. I say we like to create ambient architecture, architecture that can fade in and out of your consciousness and um, and be part of your world in different ways. Um, and I think he's been uh, parts of you know very um, I don't want to say radical, but you know uh, avant garde um, uh, scene. Uh, and then also produced some of the biggest names in um, in the music industry. So I think um, he's he's a person that uh, is worth um, considering for your show. Well, we'll try to try to get him for sure. Uh, Morris, what a joy to have a little bit of time to be able to talk to you. You know, uh, I'm sure some of the stories we have told before, but, you know, to be able to go a little bit deeper and put a little bit of those layers and, you know, and see uh, not only your your work approach, but your, you know, your life in it, you know, how much that has influenced you and, and people around you as well. So I want to thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a tremendous joy to, to talk with you today. No, I, I want to thank you. And actually, this was very different from most of the interviews or, or conversations I have. And I, and I feel like it did go deep. And I talked about some of the things that I normally talk about, but a lot of things that I think I don't normally talk about. And I think that's why this has been so enjoyable. Ah, Thanks again. Have a phenomenal day and let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you again. Submission for the Creator Design Awards are now open. Visit creatordesignawards.com to find out more. Experience the world of art, design, and culture through Minded Podcast. Engage with groundbreaking artists, visionary designers, and cultural influencers and delve into their creative processes. Minded Podcast, powered by the CDA. New episodes every Tuesday.